Welcome everyone who is joining us today. Um, welcome to our emerging conversation about COVID-19 vaccines. Um, we will start in about one minute. We're gonna let some people funnel in from the waiting room and we'll be starting in about one minute. Okay, we have a busy agenda today, so it is noon. So we'll start now while people uh, come into the waiting room. I wanted to welcome everybody to our emerging conversation today. My name is Dr. Eric Ball. I am a primary care pediatrician at uh, the Chalk Primary Care Network in Orange County, California. I'm also the district vice chair for the American Academy of Pediatrics in California. Today's, um, Cameron, can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, today's uh, emerging conversation is about the updated COVID-19 vaccine and what you need to know about it. Uh, as many of you know, we've had a series of these conversations uh, for the past four years since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've had over 20 of them and um, each on different topics. We've moved away from COVID as, um, as time has gone on, but we're bringing it back today because we're in the middle of a wave and because a new vaccine uh, was just announced. Uh, we wanted to thank the California Immunization Coalition, as always, for sponsoring this, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics in California. But also, specialty, especially today, we have additional sponsors of the Infectious Disease Association of California and Sutter Health. We'd like to thank them for helping to spread the word about this important webinar. Next. So just some basic logistics. Um, this is a webinar format. All lines will be muted during the program. There's a Q&A box that will be on the bottom. For those of you who have been on these calls before, we will have uh, a presentation from each of, our, uh, each of our speakers, and then we'll have some time at the end for a conversation and some questions and answers. We received a ton of questions before, and then we'll also look at questions in the Q&A box throughout. And then as always, this webinar is recorded and posted to the California Immunization Coalition website, as well as our YouTube page. You can find all of our previous webinars on there, including one we did about two weeks ago, which was about uh, preparing uh, your patients for international travel, all about international travel, international vaccines. Next. And again, thanks to all of our sponsors. Oh, I forgot California Department of Public Health, who always uh, is such a great sponsor and helps spread the word for these. Um, webinars. Next. And then uh, I am joined today by Dr. Panaraj, who will introduce herself. And again, my name is um, Eric Ball. I'm a primary care pediatrician at the Chalk Primary Care Network. I'm the vice president of the California Immunization Coalition and the vice chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics in California. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, I, we're very lucky to have Eric with us. He's uh, done so much for the California Immunization Coalition, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics. He and Dr. Alice Quo are, are running for District 9 AAP chair. So don't forget to vote, that's in two weeks. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Pia Panaraj. I am um, an infectious disease um, professor at the University of California, San Diego, and I'm the current uh, president of the CIC. And I have the pleasure of introducing our two wonderful speakers. Dr. Jeff Silvers, Jeffrey Silvers, is the medical director of infection control and pharmacy for Sutter Health, where he serves as the physician lead in antimicrobial stewardship, infection control, epidemiology, emerging infections, and pharmacy for the healthcare system. Uh, he works closely with the California Department of Public Health, having served on multiple advisory committees. Um, and he has spent the last 35 years caring for patients with complex infectious diseases. He's also on the board of directors for the Infectious Disease Association of California, um, and soon to be a board member of the California Immunization Coalition. Um, and then uh, after him, um, Dr. Dean Blumberg will be speaking. He is a professor in chief of pediatric infectious diseases at UC Davis Children's Hospital in Sacramento. Um, he um, 
is the head of the infection prevention at Shriners Hospital for Children, also in Northern California, and he's provided expert testimony at numerous California legislative hearings and participated in several federal and international advocacy activities. He's worked on clinical trials with Ebola vaccine development in Liberia on behalf of NIAID, and he's the co-creator and executive producer and co-host of Kids Considered podcast. So you should all check out that podcast as well. So thank you both for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Silvers. Thank you. Thanks for in inviting me, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'll have the next slide here. So it's been four and a half years since uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus first uh, started its relentless course, and the disease continues its uh, quest to continuously propagate. It's an RNA virus, and RNA viruses uh, have a lot more mutations than DNA viruses, and they don't necessarily check for mistakes when they make the RNA replication. And as a consequence, there's a lot more um, opportunities uh, for, for mutations to appear and accumulation of mutations, which could lead to new strains. And when there's so much disease circulating everywhere, uh, various mutations and strains eventually uh, show up and we might see very strains appear and we see recombinants like we have with the XBB strain in 2023. The updated formulation of the two mRNA vaccines were approved last uh, Thursday by the FDA. And our goal today is to provide information about the updated vaccine, what's different, what's new. And importantly, we need to discuss why people should get this updated vaccine. So what do the numbers mean? Okay, well, everyone knows that there's a surge of COVID right now, but I suspect that most people don't know a whole lot more than that. And people in general are not as sick as they were with the very early strains, but there's still a lot of people who end up in hospital, a lot of people who end up very sick. And the fact that they're not as sick in general uh, is probably related to the combination of people being vaccinated and having had natural disease infections, which led to natural immunity. It's really that combination that's been uh, the most protective, but but both of them, uh, vaccines and uh, natural disease uh, themselves do provide some protection, but we can't depend on natural immunity. We don't wanna get sick the first time and we can't depend that we won't get very sick. Uh, you know, over a million people died in 2021 um, in the United States from COVID and they never survived to benefit natural immunity and we didn't have a vaccine. Now the number dropped down to 250,000 the following year after the vaccine, which is an incredible drop from a million, and 76,000 people last year. But to keep lowering that number, we need to keep vaccinating people. And so we need to make sure people understand why and, and recognize the, the impact and import of getting vaccinated, not just for yourself, but for your friends and your family and everyone you have contact with. The next slide shows um, a graph, of, actually it's a map of the United States, and it's divided by uh, the 10 regions, which are human health so uh, service uh, regions in the United States. It measures molecular tests and they color coded by how high the positivity rates are with green being the lowest and there's two shades of green and yellow being moderate and orange two shades being the highest. Now it's important to note that yellow is between 10 and 14.9% positivity rate. That's still very high. If, if you use for comparison, when the um, flu positivity rate is over 5%, that's considered an outbreak. When the RSV positivity rate is over 3%, that's considered an outbreak. And here we are with COVID, and they're still green if you're up to 9.9%. So we know what's endemic and there's a lot around. So if you look here, region nine, July 5th was the only region in the United States that was orange. A couple around us were yellow and everybody else was green. Now go to the next slide and look at August. Wow, this is only six weeks. The whole country is yellow and orange. Now California region nine has gone from orange to yellow. So we're a little lower still, but we're still quite high. 
And look at region six now where rates are over 20%. Next slide. Now people hear a lot about wastewater tracking and most people don't really understand much about it. What it is is they look for specific organisms in the sewage water and they can then see whether the rate uh, of that particular organism goes up or down to give you some idea what's going on. And they can be very sensitive. So this is the wastewater tracking for, for COVID from July 5th. Most of the country was very shades of green, which are lower levels. And as the levels rise, then they go more to the blue teal, to the dark blue, to the almost black. And with almost black being the highest, and you can see July 5th, there were only a couple of places that were almost black, like Nevada and Colorado and, and Florida. And we were at a blue July 5th, but look at the next slide in August. Wow. I mean, this is incredible. When you just look at these two slides, the impact of how much the wastewater started showing COVID the concentrations in those few weeks, you, you know there's going to be a big outbreak. Next slide. So what about testing positivity rates? So I, I, I track data in, in Sutter Health. And so I put two different graphs up here. The one on the left shows all age weekly positivity rates with uh, two run charts there. The first run line is the orange, which is our ambulatory positivity rates. And the blue one is the acute, which is mostly ED. And they follow the same pattern, but you can see the positivity rates in ambulatory are much higher uh, with the uh, on the right there than the blue, because a lot of people were sick, but not sick enough to go to the ED. Now, this is only hospital tested uh, molecular test. This doesn't count home testing or all the people who are sick who don't get tested. But clearly, the, the numbers that were positive in the ambulatory was up to the mid 30%. Remember, the outbreak level for RSV is 3% and flu is 5%. So here we look at people 60 and older, which are the highest risk. And you'll notice kind of the same pattern. Uh, this one only goes back to uh, December of last year, doesn't go back and include last summer. But again, you can see ambulatory is much higher than acute ambulatory being red and acute EDs being green. But the positivity rate in people over the age of 60 who sought medical care with respiratory tract symptoms is about, was about 42%. Now, happily, all four of those run lines show the numbers decreasing now. And then some of that is dilutional from increased testing, but actually the ambulatory is not, and shows that we're at least on the other side of the uh, surge in California. Next slide. Okay, I mentioned multiple strains of COVID can happen from all the mutations. And if you look at each of these vertical uh, uh, color graphs here, you'll see that the colors change, and that just depends. Each color is uh, based on a particular strain. It doesn't get on this list unless 3% of the um, isolates are, are um, in there. And you'll notice that uh, there's a bunch of different colors there. And that's because there's so many circulating strains. They're all vying to uh, become the dominant strain and, and with increased transmissibility. But you notice on the far right one, uh, the KP.3.1.1 is, is kind of the teal colored and the one below that, uh, kind of a, a reddish pink there is, is KP.3. Those are part of the flirt strains and those are what are driving um, our surge right now. Uh, but you'll see things kind of change as time goes. Can I have the next slide here? So people get, why is this vaccine different? Why do I need it? The, the Pangu lineage shows uh, all the different strains that uh, are of significance that come off of the original strain. Now, I don't show the all the way to the left of the original strain because it wouldn't fit in the slide. But what I wanted to show is the difference between the previous vaccine and our present updated vaccine. So the green arrow on the left shows the XBB.1.5. That was a recombinant strain that was circulating when the last vaccine was released. And so that's the previous vaccine. But notice how the road has changed. That road's gone on to various XBBs and various other things, but that's not where the virus is. The virus is on the, is on the top right for all these flirt strains. So the circulating strain now, which I showed you previously, the KP.3.1.1 is that purple arrow. And look how close the red arrow is to that. 
Okay, look how far the green arrow is. So the previous vaccine was, provides minimal, it provides a little limited time coverage for the circulating strain, but the new update vaccine should be very effective. If I can have the next slide. Okay, so why do I need to be vaccinated again? I mean, how effective is this vaccine? Great question. So let's look at the lives saved with the COVID vaccine. So Lancet Respiratory Disease published an article uh, just a few weeks ago. I, I put the link there. It looked at data. Uh, it really looked at uh, two, about two and a half years worth of data. It was the first large study to include Omicron. Omicron was the outbreak where our healthcare systems were overwhelmed. Okay, that was the big one. Okay, it looks at the World Health European region, so almost 50 different countries and territories. So it's a big, big span. And they look data weekly and they divide it by age group, mortality with the infection, the vaccination uptake, and circulating variants, which I showed you can vary quite a bit. Next slide. Here's the results. So the vaccine, the COVID vaccine reduced by deaths by 59%. About 1.6 million lives in Europe were saved. And about 96% of the lives saved were people over 60. Okay, so most of the people that died were over 60, but there are a lot who were younger and, and there's a lot who had major complications. The first booster saved about 50% of the lives and 60% were saved during the Omicron period. So this is lives saved, that's mortality. It doesn't look at the morbidity, which is another, another thing we need to address, but this is incredibly impressive results. Next slide. Okay, so I'm healthy. Why do I need the vaccine? Explain to me again, I don't think I'm gonna die. Okay, well, what about long COVID? So people who survived COVID uh, during the Omicron and the Delta, that were in the hospital. Happily, they didn't all die, but a lot of them were in critical care units. A lot of them got blood clots. A lot of them also developed long COVID. Now, long COVID isn't really making much news right now. It's off the radar, but it isn't gone. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, Lancet published a, a clinical update uh, July 31st. And I lift, put that reference there. It talks about the syndrome, how the diagnosis is made, because as, since there's no tests and there's there's no di there's no diagnostic test, there's no diagnostic markers. It's really hard to say for sure someone has long COVID. So until we have a test, we come up with these artificial definitions based on findings. What do people complain of? What do we see? Uh, and so the World Health Organization came up with the criteria. And this article gives you a, a really nice uh, review of, of what we see. And they asked, and the estimates now are somewhere between two and four million people in the United States are still unable to work secondary to long COVID. Now that's those are those are the people who are fully disabled. There are millions of people tens of millions of people in the United States who have residual COVID symptoms. And COVID symptoms we know not rarely go on for three years in those people. And so they may have problems with concentration. They may have headaches. They may have exertional fatigue. They may have to take a nap when they get home from work. They may not be able to tolerate some foods like they used to. They're able to work. They don't work like they function. Their social life may not be anything like it was before. So it's really important. Let's go to the next slide. Because COVID doesn't care how old you are. COVID doesn't care what your health is like. If it's going to give you the long COVID, it happens. Now, it's true that it's more common in the people that are sicker, but there's plenty of children and young adults and middle-aged adults and whatever that is defined by um, who have long COVID symptoms. So does the vaccine help? So this was Lancet from a couple months ago. This is data from Norway. And again, I put the link there. And they only looked at Norway in this one, but there was a study in March that um, uh, was uh, similar, except it looked at, uh, at three countries in, in Europe, but it collected it the same way. And they had uh, almost two and a half million people that were vaccinated and one and a half million unvaccinated. They balanced the populations very so variable so that you could do statistics and show whether 
it really makes a difference. And the rates of long COVID in unvaccinated persons were twice the rates of vaccinated persons. So it really does prevent long COVID. In everyone, oh no, I mean, vaccines aren't perfect, but if we can cut the rate down by 50%, that's half the people, okay? So what about pregnancy? Well, this was just came out uh, July 11th. I'm trying to give you all new references here. This is an NIH-sponsored multi-center trial at multiple universities, uh, medical centers all across the country. It looked at uh, over 1,500 pregnant persons who their first episode of COVID was between December 21st, I'm sorry, December 2021 and September of 2023, almost two years. It did include Omicron again, which was thought People have been writing that, uh, by the way, Omicron doesn't have as much long COVID as some of the earlier strains. Trust me, there was a lot of it. So they measure six, they measure symptoms six months after the primary infection. Because six months, you can, if you've got symptoms that weren't there in the six months before you got had COVID, you could say it's new. And by the time it's six months after you've had COVID, uh, majority are long past their, their uh, delivery date and uh, adjustment to the new baby and the postpartum issues. Over 60% had their first infection during Omicron. Now, I keep mentioning that because some people are writing, well, the risk of long COVID is not as high with Omicron. It may have been a little lower, but there's so much disease there, the numbers are enormous. About half of them were fully vaccinated. About half of them were in their third trimester. Almost 96% resulted in live birth, which is, is about what they would normally expect. And the symptoms of long COVID, one out of 11 people had symptomatic long COVID 10 months after their infection. Oh my goodness, 10 months and one out of 11 and over 60%, it was during Omicron. Most of the symptoms were fatigue, increased exhaustion after exertion in GI. Very moving. Next slide. So what do you really need to know? I'm ready. I'm ready. Give me my vaccine. What else do I need to know? Well, it's recommended for all individuals six months and older and anticipated to be an annual vaccine for almost everyone. No additional dose expected to be recommended for persons 65 and older. Last February, the CDC came out and said, well, uh, we should think you should get another dose of the uh, vaccine if you're 65 and older protects you. So I wasn't real fond of that because we were already moving away from the XBB. That should say, I should say COVID was already moving away from the XBB. Um, and so that's gone away. And of course, additional doses will be available for people who are moderately severely immunocompromised. Take home, six months and older, annual vaccine, anticipate it will always be starting in the fall. Next slide. What about timing? Okay, so I had a dose of vaccine recently or I had COVID recently, how do I time it? So the only people who were supposed to have had an extra additional dose of the vaccine were 65 and older. So that's why they wrote that at 65 and older. FDA says at least two months after the last dose, and that includes the new vaccine, updated strains. The CDC from the previous one said at least four months, which can be on a little bit on the long side. Um, and then if you've had COVID, uh, when can you get the uh, vaccine, vaccine update? Well, the minimum is you have to be at least significantly improved with minimal residual symptoms out of isolation, okay? But studies have shown that people who wait a little longer, their antibody response is better to the vaccine. So the CDC writes, you may consider delaying your vaccine dose by three months after infection. Well, I'm very pragmatic. I don't want to be able to, I don't want to take, tell patients, uh, well, you can wait two months or you can wait four months if you're over 65, what do you want? And I don't like to tell a patient, uh, well, you can get it as soon as you feel better or you can wait to three months, what do you want? I like to be able to provide guidance. And yeah, of course they get to help make that decision and you need to know this information if they ask questions. But being pragmatic for me is like two months after your last dose or two months after re recent COVID, it's a consistent message, it's pretty simple. Okay, this is for later, I'm gonna show that slide. So let's move on. And that's all you have, Dr. Silvers. Yep. Thank you.
Thanks. So I'm going to focus just on pediatrics. And what I want to talk about is I think that many people underestimate the morbidity of COVID in children, and I'll compare it to other vaccine preventable diseases. And the mortality also, I think, is underestimated by many, by both healthcare providers and the general public, and then compare that with other vaccine preventable diseases. And then talk about the mismatch between um, the significance of COVID um, in the pediatric population, and then really the low vaccination rates. Next slide. So this is a CDC slide that looks at the rates of COVID hospitalizations in children and adolescents. And you can see that the highest rate over time is generally in the light blue um, portion of the graph, and that's the youngest kids. So we know that COVID disproportionately uh, affects the elderly, but in children, you know, it's sort of a J-shaped curve where at the youngest ages, six months to four years of age, they bear the brunt of the hospitalizations um, in the pediatric age group. Next slide. I'd like to talk about this recent study that came out um, in Journal of Pediatric Infectious Disease Society. And this is a study um, from researchers from Yale, from um, University of North Carolina, Boston Children's, and others. And what they did was they looked at the um, uh, at critical illness and the risk factors for critical illness among um, pediatric patients. And so critical illness was defined as those um, kids who were admitted to the hospital and intubated on a ventilator, those who were in an, I in an ICU or who, who died. So severe or severe illness. Next slide. The overall um, rate of critical illness for previously healthy children, the absolute risk was about 4% for critical disease. But um, next click, at the bottom there, the um, medical complexity, um, Cameron, next. Well, well, that didn't show, that didn't translate well. Just that bottom part, the medical complexity, you can see the greater than um, the one comorbidity um, results in an increased risk of four times um, the rate of critical disease. And two or more comorbidities increase the rate more than nine times. So, so we know that, that we do have increased risk for se severe disease with many different comorbidities. And so we do, do appreciate that. Next slide. But if you take a look at the underlying medical conditions among patients admitted to the ICU for pediatrics uh, most recently in the past year or so, you can see that um, overall for children among hospitalized children with no underlying conditions, 50% get admitted to the ICU. And among those admitted to the ICU, you can see 40% have no underlying conditions. So we still do have a relatively high rate of ICU admissions of severe disease among those who have no predisposing factors whatsoever. Next slide, moving to compare COVID-19 and pediatrics to other, other diseases that we routinely vaccinate against. If you look at the hospitalization rate for COVID-19 and compare that to the hospitalization rate for hepatitis A, for varicella, chickenpox, or for vaccine-type invasive pneumococcal disease, you can see that the hospitalization rate is higher for COVID-19 compared to these other vaccine-preventable diseases, which we all agree that we should protect children uh, against those diseases. Next slide. And if we look at um, uh, deaths per year among these, uh, among other vaccine preventable diseases, hepatitis A, meningococcus, varicella, rubella, and rotavirus, you can see that there's more deaths per year uh, among children um, due to COVID compared to these other um, diseases. And so again, I think it's really underappreciated how severe COVID can be in the pediatric population. Next slide, and then I'd like to do a direct comparison to influenza because I think, you know, one of the things we've always felt at the beginning was COVID may turn out to be like influenza eventually, but it's really not there yet. If we look at the last year among deaths due to COVID, which are on the left side of these bar graphs, the darker um, grayer blue color compared to the brighter blue color, you can see in each age group, more children are dying from COVID than influenza. And we already recommend routine influenza vaccine for pediatrics. And so I think this hammers home the point that we really need to get, get kids vaccinated 
um, against um, COVID. Next slide. So if we look at, look at the vaccination rates among children um, who end up hospitalized with COVID over the past winter and the spring, um, what you can see is in the yellow bars that the vast majority of children in each age group who are hospitalized have no record of recent COVID vaccination and only a minority have in the green portion of the bar have the most updated vaccine for that season. So only 5% of children are really up to date with their vaccines and they're ending up in the hospital because they're not protected. Next slide. Looking at the cumulative rate of children being up to date over the past winter and spring, only 14.4% of children are up to date with the most recent COVID um, vaccine. Next slide. And this is worse um, among those who, um, if you look at different age groups, so you can see that those children who are um, the youngest children at highest risk of hospitalization have lower rates of vaccination. And then if you look at other groups like um, Black non-Hispanic um, patients, that they have lower rates of vaccination compared to whites or Hispanic patients. Next slide. And so this is further exacerbated by um, urbanicity. So those in rural areas have lowest rates of vaccination and those who um, have the least resources, those who have the lowest income households, they also have the lowest rates of vaccination. So, so these are, are the most marginalized patients and they're the ones who have the lowest rate of vaccination and are at highest risk for being hospitalized. Next slide. So this um, slide from the CDC looks at the proportion of providers who um, recommend um, COVID-19 um, vaccine to their pediatric patients. And what we would like, of course, is most healthcare providers recommending the vaccine. But you can see on the right side that only about 50% of providers recommend vaccination most of the time or always. And so that's a relatively low rate of providers recommending vaccination. And I think all of us who are providers are familiar with why this is. And that's illustrated on the next slide, which looks at reasons that healthcare providers um, do not recommend COVID vaccine. And so we know there's a variety of reasons that providers may not recommend um, vaccination to their pediatric patients. But four out of the top five reasons of not recommending vaccine relate to vaccine hesitancy. So, I mean, I get that. I mean, I talk to patients about, about vaccines and you know, we wish that everybody agreed with us about vaccination and we know how challenging that can be to um, talk to parents about it when they are vaccine hesitant. Um, but I'm hoping that this information um, will really encourage people that it's really necessary for us to have these difficult conversations. Next slide. So just to summarize, um, you know, COVID results in more hospitalizations than other routine vaccine preventable disease. COVID results in higher mortality than other routine vaccine preventable diseases in children. And we have this disproportionately low pediatric COVID-19 vaccination rates. We know what why this is. It's due to vaccine hesitancy. And so as healthcare providers, we really need to double down and, and recommend um, vaccination to our children. It's really essential for us to do. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you to both, both of you, Dr. Blumberg and Dr. Silvers. I think uh, we're working to get your videos back up. And then, um, so I'll just start with a question. One of the questions that came up in our in the chat, um, the timing of vaccines. So the vaccine will be out uh, any day now, we hope. And um, and flu vaccine is here uh, as well. And um, in adults, um, uh, the elderly, the uh, RSV vaccine also available, also available for pregnant women um, starting in September. What, how do you know, do we give them all at once? Do we space it out? What do you recommend? 
So for, for adults, um, my recommendation is, is ideally to get the COVID and the flu vaccine at the same time. I haven't seen anything written yet about giving all three at the same time. Uh, the, uh, but the flu and, and the COVID are really, you know, for everyone six months and older, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't really separate, uh, you know, the 40 to 50 year olds. They get the same dose as the 65 and 75 year olds. RSV vaccine has different recommendations. It's it's uh, everybody 75 and older should get it. And 60 through 74, uh, if they have underlying comorbidities, usually lung and heart disease, uh, diabetes or kidney disease are probably the big four, with lung and heart being the most common. Uh, so uh, that not a, it's not the same population. It's a little it's a little bit of a subset. So my recommendation is you get the COVID and, and the flu vaccine at the same time. You can get them in the same arm. Uh, if you can do alternate arms, but you can get them in the same arm. We're anticipating in next season of 25 to 26 that we'll have a combination vaccine available. Don't know for sure yet, but we're hopeful. Awesome. Thank you. Um, by the way, I just want, I'm looking over Dr. Blumberg's right shoulder at his ad for his kids considered podcast. It's a really great podcast and it, you guys have been doing it for a really long time now and it's excellent. And if you're a pediatrician, it's worth checking out. There's a huge database of all their old shows on their website, but, um, he and Lena do an amazing job. So just a plug. Thank for that. you. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about the makeup of the current vaccines that are coming out this year. So can you talk about differences between the mRNA vaccines that are coming out? So the Moderna and Pfizer ones versus the Novavax ones and, and the reasons for the differences. Who are you trusting that to? It's up for grabs. Dr. Silvers, you're unmuted. Why don't you answer it? Okay, so the uh, mRNA vaccines are um, are the same technology that they've been using now. Actually, for a number of years, they've been studying it before the uh, the COVID actually brought it to fruition. Um, and so they're based on the same technology of all the other mRNA vaccines for COVID. Uh, and they're based on the uh, the newer strains that are circulating uh, from what I, whereas the... Um, they're based on the FLIRT strains, whereas the Novavax has, is a protein-based technology. It's different, and uh, they're not based on the FLIRT strains because uh, when the FDA suddenly changed from the JN.1 to the to FLIRT recommendation to base the, the vaccine on, they couldn't make that change as quickly as the mRNA. So I'm not sure exactly whether the, MR, whether the Novavax is going to be approved soon, uh, again, based on a little bit older strain, or whether or not, I've, I've also heard and read that they're working on uh, developing the vaccine based on the FLIRT strain, which means it'd be probably a couple months later. Great. Can you both talk a little bit about vaccine safety, um, what we've known, anything new that's come out, and um, particularly things like cardiomyopathy, and if there's a difference between if you get, you know, a side effect from the vaccine versus from the infection itself. Yeah, I can start off and talk about that. I mean, the COVID vaccines, you know, the most routine things that everybody's familiar with are really just pain at the injection site, which goes away in a day or two and sometimes results in fever or flu-like symptoms. Um, um, headache, um, myalgias, and again, that's usually a day or two. So people generally would try to schedule being vaccinated, um, you know, at a time that's convenient for them. So not before a kid's having a te big test the next day or or some other event. Um, in terms of the more rare, serious side effects, myocarditis. Um, there is an increased rate of myocarditis, particularly in young men following vaccination. Um, there's two things to, to consider with parents who are concerned about that. One is that you can get myocarditis with COVID also, and that if you look at the benefits and risks of vaccination, there is no question that the benefits of vaccination outweigh the risk. You don't want to risk getting COVID myocarditis. Myocarditis secondary to the vaccine is relatively mild, much better outcomes than myocarditis due to other causes such as, as COVID. So if you run the numbers, you take, you take more of a risk 
with myocarditis by not getting vaccinated? Yes. So let me just add, because that was a great answer. Uh, JAMA yesterday published an article on the myocarditis comparing vaccine versus unvaccinated uh, versus natural infection versus uh, myocarditis after unrelated uh, causes, nothing related to COVID or the vaccine. And what Dr. Blumberg said is exactly right, but if people want the details, it's there. And the fact is that the general outcome with people with uh, vaccine-related myocarditis is, is better. It doesn't last as long. It's not zero effect, is it is a real entity, and it is important. Uh, all these forms of myocarditis are more common in uh, young adult males in their 20s. And uh, But if anybody wants to uh, delve into the details, it was jamming yesterday. Thanks. Um, Dr. Blumberg, there are many questions in the Q&A about pediatric vaccines. So is the uh, spacing the same as they have been in the past with these new vaccines? Do people who have never received a COVID vaccine need uh, two doses? Um, if you can comment on that. Yeah, the recommendations are the same regarding the spacing of the vaccine. So for children six months to four years of age, they could they should get either two doses of the Moderna vaccine or three doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. For five years of age and older, it's just one dose of the updated vaccine. For children, um, those were children who've never been vaccinated. For children who've had previous doses of COVID-19 vaccine, if you're six months to four years of age, then it's one or two doses of the um, uh, of the uh, Moderna or Pfizer vaccines, depending on the number of prior doses. But again, for five years of age and older, it's simple. It's just one dose of the updated vaccine. It's been challenging sometimes for some um, clinics or, or smaller practices, especially to, to obtain the vaccine and have them in their practice. What do you recommend uh, for those providers in terms of telling their patients where to get vaccinated, both for uh, adults, perhaps uninsured, uh, and also for children? So for the adults, um... Uh, you know, of course, at Sutter, you know, we're a bigger organization, so so we have the ability to store the vaccine at, at the lower temperatures and to set up clinics and, and, and manage things differently than a person in private practice would, uh, where if they don't have a cold storage, the vaccine 30 days and it's done, it's very expensive. So for those uh, situations, I think uh, recommending that they look at the commercial pharmacies like CVS and, and Walgreens to uh, get their vaccine uh, is, is a good option. Uh, the state, uh, I, I spoke with them yesterday and they've got funding, some funds coming from the federal government to be able to purchase vaccines uh, for the uninsured. Uh, and uh, more information will be forthcoming from the state as they get it. Yeah, I, and I would reiterate that, that, you know, certainly if, if it's not available through the primary care provider, you can go to commercial pharmacies. Not all commercial pharmacies are going to be comfortable um, vaccinating young children. So you need to check with that particular pharmacy. And then for those with less resources, if they have or if they can't pay for it, um, certainly local health departments, some local health departments will have events to uh, make the vaccine available. We had a ton of questions both before and, and during the um, webinar about vaccine hesitancy. And as Dr. Blumberg mentioned, this is uh, a driver of doctors not talking about this vaccine, unfortunately. So I'm wondering, this is a whole talk onto itself, so we don't really have time for it, but um, just address one thing for me. So I'm thinking about some physicians who would assert that low risk people don't need boosters every year because they're generally at low risk. So I'm wondering if one of you could convince me if I'm a healthy 30 year old person who's already had COVID a few times and had a few vaccines, what's the benefit of getting a vaccine this year? I'll, I'll just go first on that and just say, you know, I hope I've shown data that shows that for at least for children, that previously healthy children are at significant risk for ending up in the ICU with COVID and dying of COVID. 
And as Dr. Silvers mentioned, you know, long COVID is 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 a big deal. It's life changing. So anybody who's seen a patient who's had long COVID, their life is dramatically changed for the worse, and their family's life is significantly impacted. It's estimated that that long COVID will cost the economy billions of dollars to translate that into dollars, because people don't have a, a, don't achieve as much educational levels, and then they, that affects their economic prospects too. So it's really life changing. Dr. Silvers, do you have anything to add? No, I, I think he he surmised, uh, summarized it very nicely. It, it really is. It, and it isn't just about you. It's also protecting your family and your friends. Okay, so let's go with long COVID again. You got the infection. You didn't get sick. By the way, your partner got it from you, and they got long COVID. Life-changing. Definitely. So about protecting both you and your everybody around you. Um, there's a question in the chat about, uh, you know, oh, it seems like there's been a summer surge every year for the last several years. Why don't we try to vax before the summer? Well, that's a great question, and which I wonder also, by the way. So um, as, as uh, Dr. Ball talked about, you know, or, or maybe it was Dr. Blumberg about, uh, uh, actually it was Dr. Blumberg about the flu and, and the annual and, and COVID's kind of getting there, but it's not there. Well, it may never get there because it's really not like the flu. It's not once a year. It's it's uh, it's at least twice a year, and it, it does appear at least for the last few years that our summer summer surges are bigger than our winter surges. But that doesn't mean that it will uh, stay that way uh, as it keeps mutating. There's no particular reason that I would think that it's going to stay summer predominant and winter uh, surge smaller. It could change. That could change overnight. What we have to be able to do is be prepared to, to be able to transition uh, and, and address it. And, you know, the mRNA vaccines are uh, more capable of, of changing production lines and coming out with the new vaccine in a short period of time. And, and hopefully if we can improve the uh, sustainability of the uh, immune response and decrease the uh, complication rate, even the local complication rate will improve the uh, acceptance. And, and maybe be more effective. We have room to grow. You know, vaccines are perfect. Our knowledge is not perfect. Thanks. Um, so while, while we were on this webinar, I literally got a text from my father saying that he got COVID and oh. tested positive this morning oh. and was pretty oh. sick and was starting on Paxlovid. So um, he was going to get his booster like this week or next week. Um, so what do you, what do you recommend as, uh, the timing now? Like how long should he wait? Should he still get it next week or is he safe to give it a little bit of time now? Well, as I showed in that slide, uh, my simple explanation is, is two months. It just kind of as a standard for last dose or recent COVID. Uh, you can get it as soon as you're out of isolation and feeling pretty much well, uh, or up to three months. Uh, and there's data supporting that the response to the vaccine is a better a little further out from the uh, recent infection. And the recent infection should pro provide some good antibodies. And uh, so my recommendation, honestly, is about two months. Can you talk a little bit about Paxlovid? Um, safety use in, in uh, including in pregnant persons and in children and um, the rebound that's associated with it. And then the other thing that I hear sometimes is, oh, I don't need to get the vaccine. I'll just use Paxlovid. What do you think about that? I'm, I really encourage people to be treated with Paxlovid if they do have um, COVID. So Eric, I hope your father's being treated. Um, you know, the, really the major, there's two major impediments to its use. And one is that um, it does have significant drug interactions, um, but those can be managed. And, you know, certainly for adults, the most common is, is um, 
for the lipid lowering agents and you just stop them for a few days and it's no problem. And then you restart a few days later. Um, and the other thing is that it does cause significant nausea. So somebody who has um, a GI issues as part of their COVID, they may not be able to take it. Um, and, and so that can be an impediment, but it, it works really well. It continues to work really well. There's very little viral resistance. It decreases risk of serious disease, of hospitalization, um, of critical illness, and it decreases risk of, um, some studies suggest it decreases risk of long COVID um, also. So I, I highly encourage it. And I think the, the safety is, you know, there's, there's been a lot of use, so it's a safe medication. Um, what, what are your comments? Oh, oh no, go ahead, sir. I just wanted to follow up. What What are your thoughts about people thinking they can use that instead of the vaccine? You know, the, it's a backup plan. So vaccination is the is the first choice, and then if there is breakthrough illness, then then Paxlovid is the backup plan. You can't rely on that to keep you out of the hospital. So you know, certainly, I I just think of it as a second choice, not a first choice. Uh, thank you. Um, two things. First, um, thanks for everyone to who joined us. We had an incredible, uh, incredibly large number of people participating in this webinar today. There's obviously a lot of uh, interest in this. So thank you. If you have colleagues who wanted to see this webinar and couldn't get on because we maxed out, we broke Zoom um, or couldn't make it at this time, please let them know that um, this and all of our webinars are recorded and are on the California Immunization Coalition website, as well as our YouTube site. Um, we've done over 20 of them, uh, a lot on COVID and a lot on other subjects as well. Um, so anyway, so if you have friends who were not on today, just let them know. Um, and then uh, secondly, a question for uh, our panelists was, uh, we had a lot of people ask about non-vaccine prevention. So for example, masks and ventilation and what have you. So just personally, um, are you wearing masks in the office with patients, within um, airplanes, things things like that in this current environment? What are you doing to protect yourself and others? So um, I vary. Um, if I go when I go to the hospital, I, I wear a mask all the time. Um, you know, I'm, if I'm in my administrative area and office, and I'm not really, and I have a private office, so I'm not with a lot of people, although they're nearby. I, I don't mask. Um, honestly, uh, you know, this is kind of the big surge right now. Um, I, I've been, I've been lucky and, and there are times I do mask, uh, when we go to large events, uh, and but for smaller stuff, I, I typically do not right now. Yeah. I also typically mask in patient care areas. I'm in an administrative office right now, so I don't routinely mask. And I've returned to masking when I do errands, when I go to the, the grocery store, or the big box store or others. I don't know where those people have been really. And sometimes you're close to them for, for a while in the checkout line. And I can't tell you the number of people who I know who had COVID after traveling. And you know, during travel, you're compromised. You're like so close to people, you know, at the TSA checkpoints and certainly on the plane, you don't know who you're gonna be sitting next to for a prolonged period of time. So I recommend regular masking at the airport while traveling. And then I upgrade to an N95 or KN95 once on the airplane where you really can't move or be, be apart from um, other people. And I also recommend that people who are traveling, um, if they can get a, if, certainly if you're traveling internationally, I do recommend traveling with COVID tests and with a backup um, supply of Paxlovid, because it's not easily available in other countries. And you don't want COVID to ruin your vacation, um, whatever you're traveling for. So that can really um, make travel easier if you have those on hand. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of uh, second the fact that uh, so many people I know who get COVID have gotten it from going to weddings or traveling or big concerts or things like that. Uh, uh, the convention, the Democratic convention, the Republican convention, things like that. And then also, Eric, we, we have this last slide here that we put together to just make sure we review that. Uh, you know, uh, I think what we really want you to take home after our presentation today that you need to vaccinate, improve your chances of a lucky roll of the dice. 
okay, you may not get COVID, okay? Uh, but you, if you get exposed, you want to increase your chance that you'll be fine. I mean, you drive your car, uh, you uh, may not get into a crash, you may not need that seatbelt, but you put it on because if you do get in a crash, it's a good thing you have it. And there's no get out of free, a jail free card for COVID either. Just because you've had it in the past doesn't mean you won't get it again. And you need to plan ahead and stay safe. Thank you. We talked today about so many compelling reasons to vaccinate, to protect ourselves, our families. How do we get this information out to the public so that everybody can know what we know to protect ourselves? So there, there's two parts to this. Um, yeah, different people need information presented different ways. Okay. Uh, I mean, when I say, why do I need the vaccine? I, I think a lot of it, it is about me I'm as, as the patient, as the person who's getting vaccinated. It's all about me. And I think that's true in the healthcare environments also, that you'll see people who are not uh, excited about getting the vaccine and they're really thinking about themselves. But we need to address those. What, what are their personal concerns? And you need to show empathy, but you need to present the information to them at a level that they will understand and that answers their questions. And we also have to be realistic. Not 100% not of the people are gonna get vaccinated. And that's true for any vaccine. So um, there will be some where we won't be able to convince, uh, but we still can offer them education, hopefully at the level that they're interested in, if they're willing to accept it. And I think we'll be successful uh, overall. And, and obviously we can, have a lot of room for improvement with the COVID vaccine. Yeah, and I'll just add, like, I'm a numbers guy. So to me, I think logically, and so I always like to start with numbers, but numbers don't generally work. I know that because there's studies that show that numbers don't work. And what works better than numbers are stories. And so I do start with numbers, but then I move on to stories. I've seen kids die of COVID. I've seen personally kids with COVID whose lives have been change. You know, I can just say that I saw, you know, it depending on the season and depending on if I'm on in the hospital lately, I can say, you know, I just saw a kid in the ICU with COVID. Um, and so these 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 anecdotes, although they're not scientific, you know, that that is the kind of thing that convinces patients and parents, just like what convinces patients and parents is that some kid somebody that they know got a shot and then was later diagnosed with autism, you know, that convinces them more than the, than the numbers in terms of scientific studies. So those stories, I think, are, are very valuable to share. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. And um, thanks to Dr. Blumberg and Dr. Silvers for being our panelists today and for your excellent presentations and answering all of our questions. Um, we, the California Immunization Coalition, are on a uh, a, a mission to get everybody geared up for the winter and fall cold and flu season. So we not only had this webinar, but also wanted to remind you there's an upcoming event on Thursday, which is the San Diego Immunization Coalition is pre presenting their 20th annual Kick the Flu Summit. Um, so uh, you can join online or in person if you're in San Diego. And then also we are having yet another emerging conversation, our third in a month, um, in two weeks um, on Tuesday, September 10th, um, which will be about RSV, in particular RSV vaccinations in the maternal and pharmacy setting, um, preparing for the upcoming RSV season. And that will be with um, uh, Dr. Richard Dang, um, who is a clinical uh, pharmacy uh, professor, and Dr. Neil Silverman, who is a professor of OBGYN at UCLA. Um, and then a reminder that um, there will be an evaluation survey, which will pop up on your screen as soon as we're done with the webinar. Please fill it out. It's brief. Um, it helps us to uh, make these better and to figure out uh, uh, topics for future webinars. And then um, again, you can find all of our emerging conversations on our YouTube channel and on the California Immunization Coalition. Just another plug that if you're an American Academy of Pediatrics member, our national elections are September 11th to September 25th. So make sure you vote um, on that for uh, state and national leadership. And with that, I want to thank Dr. Blumberg, Dr. Silvers, and as always, Dr. Panaraj, 
uh, and then the team, uh, Catherine and Cameron from California's Asian Coalition. And thanks to all of you participants on the call for what you do in keeping California healthy. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you, everybody.